instead of called this Jesus is in the boat. Some of you have boats and you enjoy spending time on the water. Maybe you go fishing. I'm not sure what you do anymore, whether it's, it's uh, um, water skiing or boarding, snow, uh, tubing or boarding, whatever that may be. We had an older boat when we were in Ontario. It wasn't a fancy boat, but it did the job. And uh, we went fishing with it. We went water skiing and tubing. Kids really enjoyed being out on the water. Chesley Lake was the place where we normally went to camp and where we were on the lake as well. And the lake at Chesley would often get rough. It would get really choppy. And our boat wasn't really strong, and so we would have to wait until the, until the water calmed down before we would take our boat out. Uh, I've never been on a lake in the middle of a storm, a bad storm, but I imagine it could be quite scary. But I remember being at Peggy's Cove in Nova Scotia numbers of years ago. And as we were, it's a beautiful place, I'd love to go back again sometime. It was one of the highlights of that trip out east. But um, I remember as we were walking around on the rocks that a storm came in. And the sky got dark and the winds got stronger and it started to, to rain and the waves came crashing in on top of the rocks. And we were, it's dangerous, we were warned that if the, when the waves are coming in, you really gotta be careful because all of a sudden something can come in. And uh, just not too long before we were there, someone had got washed into the water from the waves. It, was, it, was, it, it can be very dangerous, but it was also quite the sight to see. So we decided it's when it started to rain that we would go into the restaurant. The restaurant was right out on the rocks and have lunch there. And there were big windows uh, all around so you could watch the lightning flashing around us. And it was pretty awesome. It was also the best fish meal that I have ever had. And I would imagine that it was probably caught each day. I don't, I don't know, but it was a really, really great meal. By the time we were done eating, the storm had stopped. It had passed by and we were able to go back out on the rocks and explore again. We've been looking at John's signs in his gospel. Signs that point to who John, who Jesus is and what he came to do. And in John 2, we saw the first sign, Jesus turning water into wine. And it was a, a sign that revealed his true identity, that he was the glorious son of God. But also a God who cares, a God who gets involved, and a God who surprises us with what he does. And the question I suggested that that story asked us, that we needed to ask ourselves is, how am I going to respond to a God like that? How am I going to respond to a God like that? Last week we looked at the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 plus people with just five loaves of bread and two small fish. And we're told everyone, that's, that verse always strikes me when I'm reading those stories. Every one of the gospel accounts says that everyone was fed and everyone was satisfied. And there were 12 baskets of leftovers. And John points to something beyond the miracle. He's not just feeding hungry people, but he's showing that Jesus himself is the bread of life, the only one who can truly satisfy every human hunger. And not only able to feed the hunger within us, but our spiritual hunger as well. Jesus doesn't just give bread to satisfy our, our physical hunger, but he is bread to satisfy our souls, and he came into the world to be bread. And I think this is really demonstrated. I was thinking about, uh, I always go home and think, think about the things I forgot that I could have mentioned, but as I was thinking about this story when I went home the, last, uh, the beginning of the week, I, I think that, the, that this is really demonstrated, that Jesus is the bread of the, of the world. When you think about the 12 baskets of leftovers, 12 baskets, one for each of the disciples. And I think Jesus is saying to them, hey guys, I'm able to provide for you. I'm able to look after you. They didn't see any way possible to feed all those hungry people. And at the end, Jesus feeds all of the hungry people and he gives them all, he gives the 12 disciples a basket of leftovers. I think that's pretty neat. The crowds want more bread. And we're told that they want to make Jesus king. They want Jesus for what they can get. And the, the ultimate goal in, in having a Messiah come is to deliver them from Rome. But Jesus is doing something far greater and far bigger and far deeper. He's shining the light of God's presence, God's love, and God's new creation into the world. Jesus is king. He is the Messiah. 
but not in the way that they want. So we're told he separates himself from the people. He sends the disciples back across the Sea of Galilee towards Capernaum, and he goes up in the mountains to pray. This happened in the evening, and now the disciples are out on the lake. <clears throat> it's dark. It's night. They're not in a high-speed motorboat. I read as I was doing a little bit of research this week that the disciples should have been able to make that trip in about two hours. But the Sea of Galilee is famous for its bad storms coming in real quick. The sea is 21 kilometers long and 13 kilometers wide, and it's surrounded by mountains from what I read. And these mountains funnel the winds down to the sea, and it can be very dangerous. And that's what happens. Suddenly a storm comes up, and it gets very windy, the waves get bigger and rougher, and the rowing gets harder and harder. And the disciples are frightened. They're scared. They know that people have drowned. They're scared that they might drown. These are seasoned fishermen, and they're terrified. Matthew tells us that they think that they're seeing a ghost. But John tells it the story differently. And again, I think there's a reason for that. It's because he's showing who Jesus is and what he came to do. And so he tells the story in a very laid-back, more matter-of-fact way. It doesn't include a lot of details. The disciples don't know this, but even from the land, Jesus knows they're struggling. It's dark and it's stormy, so he can't see them, but he can see them. He knows they need help, and he comes to them walking on the water. And when they see him, we're told they're even more terrified. They don't think, oh good, here comes Jesus to help us, he must be God. No, they're frightened, and they're shocked, and they're terrified. But Jesus immediately speaks to them. He says, it is I, don't be afraid. His words, it is I, in the Greek, carry the same sense as when God told Moses that his name, God's name, is I am who I am. It's me, it is I. So Jesus uses that same idea when he says, I am the bread of life. Again, picking up on those words, it is I. I am who I am. He's identifying himself as God. Now we don't know if the disciples made that connection or not, but after he speaks to them, they're willing and eager, and I expect even thankful to welcome into the, him into the boat with them. And we're told that at once, they're at their destination. A few things I want to highlight from the story. First is that Jesus comes to them in the midst of the storm. Now, as I was thinking about the story, I had to wonder, were they questioning as they were rowing, as they were fighting against these waves, probably being pushed backwards and even further away from their destination, were they questioning, where's Jesus? Why has he left us alone like this? They've just experienced an amazing miracle. Jesus fed this huge crowd, plus these baskets of leftovers for each of them. Now has he abandoned them? Were they questioning, where are you, Jesus? Or maybe they were just focused on the storm and their fear and trying to get to safety. I think it could be both, because I think we, we do that. That's what we would do. Like I said, Jesus already saw, not physically, but he saw them. And he knew they were in trouble. And he comes to them in the midst of the storm and in their hour of need. And he was watching out for them. He knew what was going on, even when they couldn't see them, when he couldn't, they couldn't see him. And he calls out to them, It is I. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Those three little words, don't be afraid, are God's most frequently spoken words to humanity in Scripture. I read that they're, they're repeated more than 140 times. Don't be afraid. I'm here. You may not see me, but I'm here. I see you. Don't be afraid. And like the story of the water being changed into wine, Jesus comes in the most unexpected way. So Jesus comes to them in the midst of the storm. Second, they, in, they invite Jesus into the boat. And now Jesus is in the boat with them in the midst of the storm. 
There's no mention that Jesus speaks to the wind and the waves. There's no comment whether the wind settles, whether the waves settle, whether the storm ends. In the other Gospels, it talks about that. There's no amazement that Jesus has authority even over the winds and the waves. None of that is mentioned in this account. Just that the very presence of Jesus is with them in the boat. They don't need to be afraid. They're in the best, safest place they can be, even in a storm, because Jesus is with them in the boat. They don't ask any questions about how could you have walked on water. It doesn't even mention that they fear him thinking he's a ghost. There's just that relief and that security that Jesus is in the boat with them. That's what matters. They invite Jesus into the boat. And then wonder of wonders, we're told, third, that they are at their destination. There's no more rowing, no more struggle, just the safety of being where they need to be. Jesus is in the boat. Jesus is guiding them home. And I wonder, again, if after seeing Jesus turn water into wine, that huge amount of wine, and after watching him feed the 5,000, the disciples are all of a sudden starting to get a little more used to the way that Jesus, the way God does things. Starting to realize a little bit more who he really is. But they may also be confused by the way he does things. It's not predictable. It's not the way we would do things, and it might not even be the way we would want things done. I read an article this past week about whitewater rafting. Have any of you been whitewater rafting? Yes? Okay, good for you. I've never done it, and I don't think I want to. <laughs> so this is what I read, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a guide who steers the boat. The people in the boat don't steer. The guide steers the boat. You paddle, and you do what the guide tells you to do. So that's your job. The guide may say, right side forward, or left side backward, or all forward. He gives the directions, or she, and you follow the instructions. You paddle. Why? Because the guide knows the river. You don't. He knows where there are rocks just below the surface. He knows where there are whirlpools that can suck you under. The guide knows the way. He's been that way before. You want to get safely to your end destination? You follow the guide's instructions, and you let the guide guide. That's got to be the wild, fun, and safe part. I imagine there's got to be a safe part about it, of whitewater rafting. As I prepared for this, a song went through my mind. It's an old, old hymn. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the ski, ski, like a ship upon the sea, Lord, who rules the wind and water, stand my, by me. In the storms of life, we need help. We want to be safe. We want to get through trials and struggles. And we want to get safely to our destination. And we are afraid. That's one of the reasons why it says so often, don't be afraid, because we are. And Jesus sees us, and he knows what's happening. And he comes to us, and he says to us, it's me. Don't be afraid. And even if the storm isn't calmed, and even if the wind continues to blow, and even if the waves are high, he's in the boat with us. He can guide us within the storm as we follow him, and he can get us to our final destination. This past week, Matthew 11, 28 to 30, has been running through my mind all week. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Come to me, Jesus says. He already sees our needs. He's already moving towards us. He's already with us. He will give us rest. Now, being yoked to him doesn't necessarily mean that the situation changes. But it does mean that he's walking with us in the midst of the storm. 
in the midst of the decisions that we need to make, in the midst of the struggles and the routine of life. Jesus' ways aren't predictable. They're often not the way we think, but he's with us. That's a promise. He is with us. And as we let him be that guide, he will get us to our final destination. May this familiar story reassure our hearts, give us hope, and deepen our trust in God again. Let us give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds on our behalf. Let's pray together. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you for your promises that we do hang on to, your promises that we have found faithful and true in the past, and your promises that we continue to hang on to. Thank you that you are that solid rock that we can cling to. And thank you that you are the guide in our boat. And Lord, even when the storm rages around us, that you are there with us. And you say, you have told us that you will give rest for our souls. Lord, I pray for rest. I pray for peace. You know the struggles that each one of us are, are uh, going through. And I pray that we may experience your peace. Again, that peace that passes all understanding. That we may experience in a new way your presence with us. And that we may in a new way continue to place our trust in you. And find you to be that, that uh, solid rock on which we stand. I thank you for these experiences that were recorded many, many years ago that continue to bring hope in the midst of whatever we are going through. Even when life is good, we, we can know that you are there. And as we experience you walking with us, we know that you will be with us no matter what we face. And I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that as uh, our annual delegate sessions are this weekend, that you will also be, be present with us in a very real way. Help us in the decisions that are made, in the reports that are given, that we may see your hand at work among us as well, and that you will continue to lead us as, a, as a, the Mennonite Church in Saskatchewan and in Canada as well. Lord, for your honor and glory, I just I thank you that uh, we can join together like this, and I thank you that you will be there. I pray that you will bless the speaker that uh, it may be a time of encouragement, a time of support, a time of continuing us on in that mission that you have laid before us. Lord, you know what is going to happen and what is going on in this next week, and I thank you that you walk with us, and I pray that as we go, that you would grant us opportunities to let the light of Jesus shine out from within us into the, into the situations we find ourselves and, and with the people that we meet. And Lord, I thank you that as you have blessed us, may we be a blessing to those around us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.